Income tax 2022-2023. Capital gain or loss. Let's do some wealth preservation with some tax preparation. Support accounting instruction by clicking the link below giving you a free month membership to all of the content on our website broken out by category further broken out by course each course then organized in a logical reasonable fashion making it much more easy to find what you need than can be done on a YouTube page. We also include added resources such as excel practice problems pdf files and more like quickbooks backup files when applicable so once again click the link below for a free month membership to our website and all the content on it most of this information comes from the form 1040 instructions tax year 2022 you can find it at the irs website irs.gov irs.gov when looking at the income tax formula we're focused once again on line one that being income remembering that the first half of the income tax formula is in essence an income statement although a strange one income up top the equivalent of expenses being the deductions to get down to the equivalent of net income that being taxable income our objective flipped on its head where we want the taxable income as low as possible as opposed to normally when we want the net income as high as possible which means when talking about the income line up top the question is is this something that is income if it is income do i have to include it or is there some kind of exemption for it so this time we're going to be talking about uh, capital gains and capital gains get a little bit tricky as well because we have the calculation of the income up top and then we also might have this concept of having different tax rates related to those capital gains which will be applied down here when we do the tax calculation after arriving at the taxable income remember that actually calculating the tax is quite complex because we have a progressive tax system already which means that the one taxable income number might be calculated using multiple different rates and now we're going to add a level of complexity possibly in that we could have different tax rates for capital gains and we may have different tax rates as we saw before for uh, dividends for example so quick justification in terms of why that might be why might we have different tax rate for capital gains note what capital gains are these are typically gains for most people we're thinking about gains from uh, the stock trades for example we're holding on to investments stocks and bonds and then hopefully those stocks and bonds will accumulate upward in value over time if we want to realize and spend the money with regards to those stocks and bonds we sell the stocks and bonds and at that point in time that's when we quote realize end quote the gains suddenly i have an opinion about the capital gains tax so the gains can accumulate upwards in other words the value of the stocks can go up in value but we don't generally have a taxable event related to those investments other than possibly with regards to dividends and interest but not with the increase in the value the capital value of the investment until the point in time we sell it and the justification for that is that the stock market will fluctuate up and down so it would be kind of a chaotic situation for us to try to realize gains and losses without having actually sold the stock so then when we actually sell the investment we're going to take the sales price minus the cost account for any kind of cost of the trades that took place as well to get to the gain now the issue with the gains that we have then why wouldn't the gains just be in ordinary income a couple justifications for that one one would be that these gains actually accumulated over a long period of time possibly because if they're long-term gains they're going to happen over at least a year longer than that oftentimes people are holding on to the stocks for a long time if you're a long-term uh, investor and therefore you might have this situation where you sold something that accumulated revenue over 10 years and you're accounting for it in one year you have the similar situation with our progressive tax system as though that situation where you have the lottery choice should i take the lottery money today or should i take it over installments over so many years into the future the tax consequence of taking it today would mean that that lump sum will increase your taxable income to the point where that the progressive tax tables for ordinary income would be much higher 
and so that can kind of distort things. Same kind of thing happens here. If I take 10 years worth of gains and realize them at one time, you might argue that you have an unreasonably high tax rate that might be applied because you didn't really get all that money. Now you invested to get the money. That's one argument. Another argument is just simply that you want to incentivize investments in the stock market. Stock market guy. And to do that, that incentivizes people to save, which is usually good. It's good to save for retirement. And we want to, of course, stimulate the economy and whatnot. And therefore, that's another argument to try to lower the the costs of investing our money in uh, stocks and bonds. Some people are skeptical of that argument, thinking that's what, you know, the, the stock traders <laughs> obviously uh, might uh, like that type of argument. But those are the arguments from a tax perspective that result in us having this more complex situation of having to realize the gain and also uh, deal with the tax consequences. Now, also just realize that you could have losses, right? So it gets actually quite complex if you have gains and losses, short-term gains and long-term gains. We might dive into that topic a little bit more in and of itself later, but for right now, we just want to think about the idea of it's going to pull into the first page of the form 1040 if we have these capital gains. Also realize if you sell other things like property and whatnot, you might end up with a, a similar situation of a capital gain that will be reported on a Schedule D. It's just that the most common thing uh, that people think of with a Schedule D capital gains are investments in stocks and bonds. Also just realize that most people have their investments in stocks and bonds uh, under the umbrella of a retirement account, like a 401k plan or an, an IRA situation where they might be earning their increase in the value of the stocks and bonds, just like if it was outside of an IRA or 401k, and they might be earning dividends and income, but those are going to usually be going back into the account and they're not actually pulling money out of that account until the point in time that they retire because that's the, the point of putting them into the 401k plan. If you pull the money out before that point, then you, you could get hit with the penalties uh, and interest. So that means when you pull the money out, then it's usually going to be included uh, as a distribution at retirement age. And that usually is included as kind of like income, right? But if you're putting money into the stock market outside of a retirement plan, which is often good if you have the money to do that over and above what you're putting into the retirement plan, because then you have kind of a nest egg or something that you can dip into, at least in the medium term. It's not the emergency money, but it's money that you can access fairly quickly by selling stocks and bonds that isn't under the umbrella of an, an IRA or 401k plan. And when you sell that stuff, that's when you would have you know a capital gain situation. Obviously, if you do taxes, you will also run into some people that just like day trading. They're going to try to get value from a short term investments, in which case the Schedule D can be quite extensive and problematic for most people. Uh, they don't do the day trading. They're long term investors and they work somewhere else. And therefore, the Schedule D is usually not that burdensome. And most of their investments, like I say, are under the umbrella of a 401k or an IRA which means you know it's going to be accounted for a little a little bit differently in terms of the distributions at retirement okay so it's going to be here on line seven if you have uh, there's the uh, capital gain uh, attached schedule d here's a quick look at uh, the schedule d the general ideas that we've got the proceeds the cost and then uh, adjustments and then the gains and losses note that there's short-term gains and there's long-term gains i'm not going to dive into that in too much detail here we might go into it in more detail later i just want to touch on it as something included in uh income another type of income now normally you will get a schedule a form 1099b from your financial institution your bank or your e-trade or your vanguard whoever you are investing with that also might give you a 1099b for interest and dividends and so on. So it might not look exactly like this, but it will say 1099B on it somewhere and it'll have the related boxes that are gonna be necessary in order to do uh, the calculation. So note that what you need to, to, to calculate is you, you need the date acquired because you gotta see if it's short-term or long-term and the date sold. Oftentimes these two things are summarized on the 1099 and then there's more detail in the full 1099 report 
because you might have bought and sold multiple stocks and bonds, for example. And the main thing that has a consequence on your taxes is short term versus long term. So, for example, if you sold like a hundred, like one, if you sold one stock, then it's pretty straightforward on the short term and long term at, at one time, not a problem. But if you're dealing with a day trader that sold like hundreds of shares, then the major thing that you need to be grouping together is the fact that these group of shares were sold under a year and these groups of shares were sold over a year, which you might summarize in your data input in the tax software and possibly then use the schedule provided to you by the, the financial institution as backup uh, and attach that to your tax return instead of entering every single trade that happened. So you, there might be some shortcuts in the data input for that kind of tedious process when you have a, a whole bunch of trades. So just to uh, kind of uh, keep that in mind. Also just note that it used to be that the date acquired and the cost are, are usually the most problematic things to come by from the investments. And it used to be that the financial institutions, remember, they're, they're just kind of facilitating your trades. So they, it used to be that you're, you're the one that's ultimately responsible for that information. And it used to be the financial institutions, finest financial institution this side of Missouri, uh, weren't held as, to close, as, as closely responsible for that stuff. But more and more, they've been trying to pressure the financial institutions, like with every kind of area, which does make it easier on a tax preparer like me. So, but I mean, to, to get them to give you the date acquired as well as the cost. Now the cost gets quite complex because you might have a, a stock that was, was, for example, inherited to you, or the stock might've had stock splits into multiple different companies, or the stock has changed. So the cost can actually get quite, uh, quite cumbersome, quite complicated. And sometimes the financial institution may not give it to you, or they might say, this is like what we guess the cost is or something. And you might have to go through, through some kind of estimate to kind of figure what the cost is. So that gets a little bit messy, but those are the, the main three boxes that we need. And we might enter them, like I say, one by one transaction into the system or try to summarize the short term and long term transactions and then provide the detail to the IRS. And then you got accrued market discount, uh, wash sale, short term gain or loss, long term gain or loss. And so short term and long term will have differences in taxes in terms of generally whether it's going to be subject to ordinary income, which is not tax rates, that is, or is it going to be subject to capital gains rates, which are typically favorable rates. So check uh, uh, collectibles if they're collectibles or not. Now you could have withholdings from your stock sales. Most of the time, most people don't because they're withholding through their W-2s or their distributions if they're in retirement from their pension plans. So you don't see that all the time, but it's possible because you do have a gain uh, situation possibly that someone withholds the tax. And if you sell a whole bunch of stocks at one time, then, then quite likely you might want to uh, withhold if you can at that point there or make an estimated payment when you pull the money out. A lot of times people pull money out and they they don't really take into consideration the tax consequences in part because they've been taken out of the system of actually thinking about taxes because the IRS has forced the employer to take that role. That means that that we really get paid oftentimes whatever we get paid after taxes and we just think, oh, you know, whatever. But and then when we do something that has a tr tax trigger an event, we don't even think about taxes because we feel like, oh, didn't the employer take care of that? Well, no, it's your financial institution. <laughs> the employer's not involved. But in any case, uh, reports to the IRS gross proceeds versus net proceeds. Uh, check if loss is not allowed, profit or loss realized, uh, unrealized profit, and so on. So those are the main boxes. You can also have the state. Line seven, capital gain or loss. If you sold a capital asset such as a stock or bond, you must complete and attach form 8949 and schedule D. So these are gonna be the tax rates. Remember that we have a progressive tax system and we have the normal or ordinary tax rates. And for the reasons discussed before, the capital rates might have a beneficiary rate if you qualify for them by having like the long-term capital gains as opposed to the short-term capital gains. Now, how are they going to then dish out or serve up those uh, more beneficial rates 
when we have a progressive tax system and everybody is not already taxed at one rate because it, it'll mean that higher income individuals will have a more favorable rate, which will still be like 20%, whereas lower income individuals, the more favorable rate may bring the capital gains rate down to, uh, to zero. Therefore, we have a structure where we're gonna be applying the progressive tax tables to ordinary income, separating the capital gains to the capital gains subject to a favorable rate, and then determining which of these favorable rates would apply based on their income level and doing that calculation, noting that on the tax software, you're not really gonna see all that happening usually because we often rely on the software to do that calculation of the actual tax. Therefore, we often recalculate with our tax worksheet, for example, the, the taxable income, rely on the worksheet on the software oftentimes to apply the complicated table structure of the progressive tax system and break out these separate taxes, favorable taxes, for capital gains and, say, and possibly qualified dividends, for example. So if single uh, and income zero to 41,675, 0%, up to, up to 15%, if it's 41,676, uh, two, uh, four, uh, 459,750, and up to 20% if it's 459,751. So the general concept you would be explaining to someone then if they were asking about the capital gains is that if you have the long-term capital gains, you might have a favorable taxable gain rate, no matter what your income is uh, for incomes that are lower income levels, then the favorable rate would be zero. If you're at a mid or moderate range, it would be 15% for many people, probably most people. And then if it's a high income level, then the favorable rate would be at 20% because the marginal rate of, of those individuals would be higher than that due to their progressive tax system and the income level they are at. Exception one, you don't have to file form 8949 or schedule D if you aren't deferring any capital gain by investing in a qualified opportunity fund. Uh, and both of the following apply. One, you have no capital losses and your only capital gains are capital gain distributions from forms 1099 div box 2A or substitute statements. And two, none of the form 1099 div or substitute statements have an amount in box 2B, unrecaptured section 1250 gain, box 2C, section 1202 gain, or box 2D, collectibles 28% gain. So the general concept here when you're doing your data input would be if, you've, if you have the 1099B that re reports the sale of stock and that usually is reflecting someone actually, the taxpayer actually selling the stock, then that will be provided and you're gonna have to look up the sales price and then subtract out the cost to figure the gain using say a Schedule D. However, as we saw when we looked at the interest and dividends, the 1099 div in particular, uh, when you have distributions from the corporation, those are gonna be a different kind of income. So if you're investing in stocks, for example, uh, or bonds, if you're investing in stocks and bonds, you might have uh, income related to interest, which would be bonds typically paying out interest, for example, or you might have dividends, which would be the company distributing out the retained earnings of the company in the form of dividends to the owner of the company, that being the shareholders, or you could have capital gains, which is our focus here, which typically is triggered only when the actual stocks are sold, the gains then being realized at that point in time. Now, sometimes when you have a distribution from the company, so the board of directors or whatever decides to give out money to the shareholders, it might dip into not just the retained earnings, but also into maybe like the original investment from the distribution of the of the original stocks. And in that case, they might have to classify it not as a dividend, but rather as a, a capital gain. And instead of giving a 1099B for that transaction, because you didn't facilitate the transaction, you didn't decide to sell the stock, they decided to give a distribution uh, and, and so it was an involuntary kind of transaction on your end. You, you own the stock, you vote for the board of directors, but they then decide what the dividend distributions will be and so on. Then it's going to be reported on the scheduled uh, 1099 uh, div generally. So then you would just record it from the data input standpoint as capital gains with a 1099 div, and you may not need to generate then 
a, a Schedule D, the software, if you have software doing that, the software might not populate a Schedule D unless you have these other boxes, uh, 1250 uh, gain and so on. So the thing you need to know logistically is if you get a 1099 div and you have something in the box for capital gains, then you're just gonna plug that into the box in your tax software and it'll typically then calculate it as, as capital gains and may or may not generate a Schedule D depending on the needs. Uh, and then you can basically wanna deconstruct that and say, well, why does that make sense? And when you talk to someone like a client, be able to explain the difference between a dividend, which has ordinary versus uh, qualified dividends. The qualified dividends might have favorable tax treatment and the distributions of a, a capital gain, which might mean that they, they distributed something over and above the retained earnings, therefore classified it as capital gains instead of uh, normal distributions. And you might have capital gains rules, which once again, you could have favorable tax treatment uh, on, on those distributions. And then when you sell stock, that's when you're gonna have the 1099 uh, B, which will give you the the sale price of the stock when the person actually physically sold the stock. Okay, exception two. So you must file Schedule D, but generally don't have to file Form 8949. If exception one doesn't apply, you aren't deferring any capital gain by investing in a qualified opportunity fund or terminating deferral from an investment in a qualified opportunity fund, or your only capital gains and losses are capital gain distributions, a capital loss carryover from uh, 2021, a gain from form 2439 or 6252 or part two of form 4797, a gain or loss from form 4684, 6781 or 8824, a gain or loss from a partnership S corporation, uh, a state or trust or gains or losses from transactions, for which you received a Form 1099-B or substitute statement that shows basis was reported to the IRS, the QOF box in box three isn't checked and you don't need to make any distributions in column G of Form 8949 or enter any codes in column F of Form 8949. Okay, so again, we've got a couple different kind of exceptions here and you've got some similar rules with some of these other forms. So for example, a gain or loss from a partnership, S corporation, a state or trust, then that might flow through, through for example, with a K-1 form. These are pass through type of entities. So it'll be kind of sim a kind of similar situation to the 1099D uh, situation where the K-1 might indicate that there was a sale of, of stocks or bonds or whatever made by the partnership or S corporation or a state or trust. And then again, you're gonna populate that into the Schedule K uh, area, which, which hopefully will help to calculate whether or not uh, it's capital gains or ordinary income due to the information on the Schedule K. And then the software will help you to determine if you need to populate a Schedule D or, or not with that, but you need similar kind of thought process and scenario. So if exception one applies, enter your total capital gain distribution from box 2A of forms 1099D on line seven and check the box on that line. If your received capital gain distributions as a nominee, that is, they were paid to you but actually belong to someone else, report on line seven only amount that belongs to you. Include a statement showing the full amount you received and the amount you received as a nominee. So in other words, the money's someone else's, but you got the 1099 for whatever reason, which would be kind of an unusual situation. You have that similar uh, situation we've seen in the past where you really want to kind of tell the IRS, yes, I'm recognizing that I got the 1099, but I'm trying to show you here in the statement that it's not really something I should be recording in income. So see, uh, subschedule B instructions for filing requirements for form 1099 div and uh, 1060, uh, 1096. We talked about the 1099 div in a prior presentation tip. If you don't have to file schedule D, use the qualified dividends and capital gains tax worksheet in the line 16 instructions to figure your tax.